Hi, this is Janet Fitch, um, and it's noon on Wednesday, so it is Writing Wednesday, where I talk about writing, writing craft, answer your questions, talk about uh, uh, man, God, and the universe, and um, all things that have to do with the written word or with the artist that the writer is. Um, and a creative act and um, you know sometimes I'll talk about other things feel free to I'm here at your disposal so uh, feel free to write questions uh, in the comments and I'm happy to answer them for you um, yeah, it's good to be anywhere right now um, I thought I would um, answer some questions that have come in to me um, from the interwebs, but I thought that our main topic would be writing in wartime because we are in wartime again right now. Um, so Lisa, hi Lisa, and then Malika says, if you have a moment, can you talk about embodied writing and how you use it in fiction, such as short stories? Yeah, I always talk about embodied writing and we're talking about writing in wartime. Um, you know, what else are we uh, but uh, bodies who are also walking around and thinking and uh, um, trying to stay alive and in proximity to other people. Um, it's interesting. I have a, um, a sense of the human being. Um, you know, you can think of people, you know, there's always this dichotomous thinking, manichaeistic thinking, black, white, in, out, up, down, good, bad. Um, and they think of the, juxtapos uh, the juxtaposition of body and spirit as if they're two different things, the needs of the body, the needs of the spirit, and they will be in opposition to each other. And, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who uh, have worked with me or know me socially or whatever, you know that I uh, am not a big proponent of dividing the human being into body and spirit, because I believe that the soul uh, maybe I've been writing and reading uh, Russian literature for such a long time. Um, but the question of, you know, what is a human being is what all of our creative arts um, deal with, right? That's what we're, we're doing here. Um, and I think, the, I think of the soul as the meeting ground of body and spirit. Um, that we are both and they intermingle on the level of the soul so uh, we're never all body and we're never all spirit because we live in the physical on the physical plane in physical bodies and we see the world through our embodied experience so that's why when you know i'm always uh, begging people to include sensual reality or start with sensual reality start with observation of the physical world of what you know what does it smell like what does it sound like what's you know what do you hear when you stop talking you know we have birds because we're having a spring right now in uh, California where I live uh, I know many people are in winter and some people are in dead summer um, but it always starting with the senses. There's always weather, there's always texture, sound, smells, light. Um, if you don't start with the physical world, then you're just floating around in mid-ocean having thoughts, and you might as well be writing philosophy. Um, the body is where it starts. And, um, you know, the spirit enlivens, enlivens us and the mixture is where it's interesting. It's like the coastal tidelands where life began, where the sea meets the land, you know, where spirit meets the body um, is where the interesting stuff happens. So uh, I never would ignore the, bo the body. 
um, where you'd use it in short story is where you'd use it in every scrap of writing, which is we are always in the body. Um, characters who are divorced from the body and have body issues and feel um, there's a name for that. Um, when people feel very much the separate consciousness that's being carried around in the body and the body feels very mechanical, the dissociation, that's a, a terrible mental illness, a mental state. Um, yet we sometimes play with a little bit. Um, I think that the, you know, always be careful of your mental health, um, but that sense of being um, an entity in the physical body is not, I don't think it's the best mental, you know, the best way of approaching life. Now this gets very personal because, you know, now I'm talking about my philosophy of life and, um, you know, writing Wednesday, this is our little fireside chat and you're going to get a little injection of what I think about the universe as well as what you think about the universe. And I happen to think that to divorce the spirit from the body is a dangerous way to see the world. It is, um, it's kind of an anti-life situation. If you see, uh, if you, it, to get away from the body and the human being's groundedness in the body. I'm not somebody who believes in um, uh, too much in, in transcendence, that you want to transcend this phase. I know back in the psychedelic days, you know, people wanted to transcend the normal experience. I'm not big on it. I, I'm big on the concept of imminence which is the presence of the divine within the things of this world. Um, you know, so that's, that's the, for me, that's the life-giving space. So, um, yeah, spirit and body need to come together. That's why I, I'm very much interested in, in um, walking meditations, in dance, in places where the body and the spirit are brought together, the soul is is enriched um, by the upper and the lower, and that we're in the middle, bringing both elements together. You know, this is maybe getting a little abstract for people, um, uh, but it's a sense of always being in the body and nurturing the body, not despising the body, using the senses uh, to be a bridge between the human being and the world of phenomena. So it's not a bridge between the spirit and the world. It is um, because I think we are such a blend of the physical and the spiritual. So the, the staying in touch with the senses gives the bridge between the world of phenomenon and the inter, interior world. So always, I'm going to always say, you know, well, where, where's the temperature? You know, what are they, what, what do you smell? What do you hear? You know, I always am going to want to know what's going on in the physical world and in the physical body. Um, yeah, where there is life, there's environment. You can't separate them. Yeah. And, you know, so that in our writing, it's very important to remember that you can't separate this thinking thing in here, these ideas and stuff from the body uh, and from the world. Um you get a very thin broth in fiction if you are just going to philosophize. If you're going to philosophize, then uh, it's nice to have some philosophy in there. I'm not saying never go to the bigger meaning of things, but I always like to work, what is it, deductively, where you start with the things of this world and the objects of this world and phenomena, and then move to the bigger issues. Let them suggest things to you. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about writing in wartime. 
Now, we are not in being bombed at the moment. You know, our closest, somebody this morning, uh, I do a morning uh, meditation and free write with Peggy Dobreer, as many people know, and you can join that up, uh, PeggyDobreer.com. Um, and somebody did bring up, um, you know, that the only recent, war we've had in on American soil was when the f planes flew into um, the uh, uh, World Trade Center, the Twin Towers um, in New York. We've had domestic terrorism, however. So we know what it's like to have a bomb go off. That's why there's schools have bombs for fake dogs. We've had mass shootings. You know, we actually have been in wartime for quite some time. Um, you know, we our capital was overtaken. I mean, <laughs> we have been in wartime. Uh, we just, just because it's not a visible foreign foil with tanks, uh, we have not quite recognized uh, what's going on. Oklahoma, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's definitely going on. But the question is, how do you how do you write during wartime? Well. I think that, first of all, poets respond faster to events. Fiction writers need a while to brew. We don't, it's like the phenomenon is happening, but we haven't processed it through our all of our layers. We're very slow, fiction writer. Fiction is very slow. Short stories are faster than, um, than, novels but even the short stories coming out of you know ukraine eastern europe third world war you know nuclear threats protests in russia protests across the world uh, the short stories are going to take a while too the poets are already on it the poets are already expressing how they are reacting uh to because a poet Poetry takes a moment and opens it all up. So anything that catches a poet's attention uh, today will, they'll think about this and it, it starts to open up and they'll draw some conclusions from what they're seeing. Um, fiction writers can't be expected to respond through, through our art on the at the drop of a hat and wartime is everything is at the drop of a hat i mean if you've seen how fast things can change uh, we tend to be overwhelmed by events uh, much more so than poets or essayists you know people who are writing nonfiction are already responding but fiction writers we have to dis not distill but it's more like um what happens before the dis distillation, you know, where we just have to cook stuff for a while. We're very slow. Uh, maybe I'm only speaking for myself, but we're very slow in responding to um, current happenings. But what we can do is notice things. And in general, when we're glued to Twitter, I don't know about you, I've been glued to Twitter 24 7 it's not been good for the novel that i'm working on uh, i do actually i do get a couple of hours in uh with percolate thank you david um percolate uh anna says war strips away non-essentials yes and no um because what is essential what i'd like you to do you know, as well as cover the news, which, you know, I mean, I'm on Twitter, I'm on, I'm getting, I'm doing my Russian translations. There's a really good site called Observer and I'm using Big Translator. I've got my Russian English dictionaries out, my 2000, my 201 Russian verbs. Um, you know, it's a Ukrainian site, but it's in Russian and I, you know, it's just like, I'm all over it. I just... It, you know, it's like, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Um, but as far as, as a novelist, rather than as a historian or a political observer, um, 
you what you want is to what you want to preserve are human moments human reactions not the movement of tanks and um the negotiations in you know at the border with belarus uh, you want to capture when people in ukraine maybe they're refugees they're on the road or they're hunkered down in the metro and they talk about how they feel that's the thing that you as a fiction writer or a novelist that's what you want to write down you know you're not going to be able to write a story about it but you i want you to just take notes um you could put it in your notebook uh your writer's notebook as wartime uh and the little bits that you see that strike you when somebody's talking about we've been down here we haven't slept you know how tired you, you might how tired you are they are how you know what is it like to hear that sound what is it like to see your play that's my car that was my car um what it feels like to hear the the russian tanks you know what what is it like to be bombarded um the sounds the smells the textures the how cold is it how hot is it little bits of human experience in the body we were talking about the body you know how to uh, david says the reality of having to console a child who is scared yeah what is that kid doing are they silent are they screaming are they crying um are they playing with a you know something while your city is being bombarded what people are saying just little quotes like somebody says something that just catches your ear little bit of news like you know i read um that the russian army was making civilians sit on the streets um out where their uh convoy was uh, in hopes that the ukrainians wouldn't fire on them you know what it would be like to be sitting there how cold would that street be you know always think of the body see this is what i mean you know the question had been about how you know how do you incorporate uh the you know the embodiment uh malaika was asking uh about embodied writing you know i mean when you're talking about wartime it's not we're not fiction is not as interested in the abstraction and um the things that historians are interested in um the things that news hounds you know like myself are watching like nonstop is not what is going to be um it's not the tools to depict uh people caught in wartime so always remember the people rather than the events um Llewellyn at says gender differences in war Hemingway versus Atwood um i think that gender differences i try not to make generalizations about gender differences because everybody's so different you'll know what interests you and if you are you know uh you know however you identify um it will that will be right for you that's what you're interested in so i try not to generalize about that because there's such a spectrum and some of these um uh, snipers in it's very interesting you know because having written this book about the russian revolution um you know having civilians defending their cities and distributing arms to people who've never held a weapon before um and how it feels to be 
defending your own city. Um, it's always the small things. It's always, you know, there's a YouTube of some Ukrainian woman driving a tank. Somebody, had, the Russians had abandoned a tank and she, it's on YouTube and you can see her like showing you how to run a tank. Um, you see her nails are polished and, you know, she doesn't look more than 25. But she's driving that tank. Um, they figured out how to run it. Um, so all, uh, so the scale is really important. When we look at the news, it's usually um, on a, it's the master shot. It's a large scale, many people, you know, huge lines of cars. So when you are taking notes um, from what you're uh, obsessively watching, or if you're me, obsessively watching, um, you know, go into one car and be there in line trying to get to the border with your children. Uh, be there as your husband you know, give them a name, is being uh, stopped at the border. It's like, you know, your kids and wife can go on, but you are coming back to defend your country. Um, have the, stop it down to the personal. Um, because fiction is all about the reader coming into the story and, and embody, becoming embodied themselves uh, in the life of the characters. So you want your character at, you know, are these people cold? Are they warm? Are they, you know, they fled with one, you know, or they're down in the metro in what they are wearing. You know, does it smell? Does it smell down there? <laughs> you bet it does. Um, you know, what does it smell like? You know, it will. Um, and then maybe in some other part of the book, they're going to smell that again and go, you know, and have have a bigger reaction than otherwise would be merited because it brings back those nights of bombardment and being in the metro. Um, liberators can be rapists and rapists are just loose, you know, so there's there's all kinds of stuff that goes on in wartime in, indeed. Um, I think that, let's see what else, if we have other questions, here's somebody, um, Ruthie said, let's see if I get, says, even this month of women's history, I don't like to, uh, generalize gender. Yeah, because it's such a, such a huge, uh, uh, swath of you know, it's such a spectrum of individual experience that why, you know, why would you have to? I remember there was a kid uh, at uh, the community of writers uh, who's now in college. And when asked, like, what their name was or whether they were a boy or a girl, he, you know, at the time would not say that he was boy. It's just like, I'm, I'm myself. He'd give his name, you know. So it's, it's our, our society luckily is kind of waking up to the fact that there's a much broader experience. Again, we tend to like that manichaeistic thing, body, spirit, male, female, you know, and there's no reason for it, you know, there's no reason for it. We're going into a more um, uh, subtle mindset where we don't need those big chunks anymore that we can have, you know, I mean, what's it say, say in the beginning of the Alexandria Quartet? Oh, I wish I could, I, I wish I could quote this exactly. Um, but he said, you know, in Alexandria, we have at least five genders. I mean, this was in 19, what was it, 47? We have at least five genders, you know? And I'm sure there's more, but um, there always has been. And, uh, um, so it helps to think about the body uh, and how scared, in a way, this is why actors make such good writers, because actor exercises, and you read about acting and method acting and, and 
how you take your own experience, like think about how scared you were when the Twin Towers were hit, if you were conscious and alive at that time. I know that's your, some of you were very small <laughs> when that happened. Um, or when the Capitol was taken, you know, how that felt and then try to imagine miss, missiles. Try to, you know, you have to start with your own experience and then imaginatively use those as, as hatches down into the larger um, human experience. Um, and just how scared can you get? And then how long can you stay that scared? You know, what happens after a while? I mean, we've all lived through this last administration. You know, how scared can you be for how long? And then you forget about it for a moment. You know, something else comes up and you have to deal with that. And you realize you spent a whole half hour without thinking about, you know, the just demise of democracy or whatever. Um, Malaika has a question. Uh, the use of second person as the narrator. Um, I, a wonderful book that uses a lot of second person is Samantha Dunn's Failing Paris. I love this book because it's written both in first person and second person. And chapters, first and second person, alternate. Uh, the first person is for the past, and the second person is for the, a present story. And I always think of you as kind of um, an assault. It's like a person on the street who grabs you and stares in your face. And it's like, you've got to understand, you've got to see it. You know, your first reaction is like, whoa, uh, maybe not, you know? <laughs> so it's quite aggressive. What it's saying is you've got to understand, you've got to see this from my point of view. And it's a very strong, <coughs> demanding voice. And I don't mean demanding for the writer. I mean demanding of the listener of the reader that you got to understand this and um it's um used more and more i mean i see it all the time i because it's used a lot in creative nonfiction because you've got to understand that speaking directly to the reader um we so you when you use it in fiction it's very hard to have give the reader any distance. So some people like to be right up in your face like that. It's even more de assertive and demanding than first person. Because first person is saying, this is my experience. This is how I, I did this, I did that. But the second is like, you, you have to be like this. You walk out there and they're all over you. And you know, the shrinks, if you've ever um, been therapized, no, I'm sure most of you haven't. <laughs> um, <laughs> but if you've ever been in therapy, you'll see that um, your therapist does not like you to talk about uh, to talk about yourself in second person, because it's a way of not saying I. It's a way of not owning the experience. You know, you just. You, you can't believe that she's saying this and, and you, you know, do this and you do that and nothing's any good and blah, and the shrink will always say, say I, say I. People are reluctant to own their experience, so they say you. Um, and it's also demanding. It's like taking the reader by the collar and say, you have to understand this. And so all, there's a lot of it in... in um, I believe in the notes from the underground by Dostoevsky. I think that guy talks directly to the reader. And you, you don't understand, or Poe. <laughs> you know, you don't understand. Uh, but it's a, it's, it's a direct 
uh, directly um, addressing the reader. Let's see, what else can I say? So in this matter of, and there's a habituation too, it's what you do. You know, it's like also we, what we do. Um, I think it's sometimes under absorbed, under examined. I'm not a huge fan of it, but it's very popular right now. Um, but I do think while we're deeply in this tragic uh, war of Ukraine and we're, you know, while we're just glued to um, our screens to like, what the hell's going on? What's going to happen next? You know, is this going to work? Is this not going to work? You know, how, how worried do I have to be? You know, I dreamed about spaceships and irradiation and, you know, that's not usually, I don't have science fiction dreams like that, but, uh, that was pretty awful. I mean, it's going in at a pretty deep level. Um, if everyone owned their own experience, the world would be a very different place. Yael said, yes, thank you. It would certainly be, it, rather saying, you do this, you do this, you know, rather than saying, I'm afraid. I need my big guns because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of you. I'm afraid of everybody. I'm afraid everything's being taken away from me. I'm afraid. No, it's like you are doing this and you're doing that and those people. Yeah. <laughs> So if you're looking for a villain or somebody who is causing trouble in your fiction, you know, you can look at people who are always, you know, have to buttonhole others or the ancient mariner, you know, you have to listen to this. Um, these are all um, opportunities, you know, options for fiction. And, but as far as writing in wartime, I think that the, I, I'm trying to think of how long after the Spanish Civil War, um, um, For Whom the Bell Tolls, the Hemingway um, Spanish Civil War novel came out. Um, well, I just happen to have a magic machine here that I can look it up. Year. Um, <laughs> uh, for Whom the Bell Tolls, published. Um, let's see. It was published in 1940. So that's three years after the Spanish Civil War. Well, published, they said it went to 1939. So it was published the following year. So it was probably written during... The Spanish Civil War probably started in, he probably started in, um, in 36 then, uh, and was able to deliver it by 39. So he probably worked on it for three years, but it's, it is so embodied. I don't know, you know, what you think of Hemingway, whether you like him or not, um, but that is an amazing book. For Whom the Bell Tolls, about the Spanish Civil War, which is um, a war that, if you don't know anything about it, is worth actually right now. It's a very uh, applicable um, situation where you had a, um, uh, it was like the first of the fascist uh takeovers in um, Europe. And we just, everybody stayed out of it, except the Russians were there uh, supporting the re Republic. Uh, but they had their, eh, you know, history, they had their own uh, agenda as well. Um, but it was a brutal attack on civilians um, and there was an international brigade that many, uh, many Americans took part in. Uh, I know that they're assembling for an international brigade for uh, Ukraine. It'll be interesting to see, you know, how that works out, how having foreign prisoners of war or foreign nationals killed will affect, you know, 
affect the diplomacy and the uh, certainly complicates the situation, but it also it would it's, it would not only add numbers to the Ukrainian forces, but it would um, hearten the people that people come from all over the world on their own dime to um, fight for them. Um, yeah, people are already flying into Poland, um, uh, crossing into Ukraine to join up. So uh, For Whom the Bell Tolls is an amazing book. Um, and then wartime, I'm very interested in civilian life. I don't know much about military life, um, but I find it, um, you know, I always read about it. And uh, certainly what happens with soldiers in a war um, is often the key to the war and how it goes as an historian. Um, but civilian life or the life of, you know, kind of ground level soldiers uh, in war is what interests me. Uh, the experience of human beings in the body, you know. Um, I'm reading a book right now about um, walking. It, it, it's 26 writers writing small essays about walking from a million different perspectives, 26 different perspectives, and sometimes more than one in an essay. Um, and uh, thinking about walking and what you see when you're walking, because it slows you down, it puts you into the body, so it's not just what you see, but it's it, there's a rhythm, because you walk in a rhythm and you stop. Um, and there's an interactivity with what you're seeing. You're not just looking out a window, you're physically in the environment that you are observing. Uh, the, Karen, this is a new book. Uh, um, I'm gonna be, be reviewing it. Uh, I think it's called uh, Ways of Walking. Um, and uh, it's, um, I'm going to be reviewing it for the uh, LA Review of Books. So I'm finding it fascinating. Uh, I like to walk. And walking is a really interesting way of um, engaging with the world, engaging with, so it works both for you uh, as a writer to train yourself to engage. You know, that the scenery isn't going by so fast that you can't stop and and try to describe what you're seeing. And you're physically in the environment. So if it's cold, you're cold. You know, if it's hot, it's hot. You know, is there a breeze? When you're driving by in the car, you don't necessarily know. But when you're walking, you know, oh, there's a breeze. The sun's coming up. You know, you feel the warmth on your face or on the backs of your legs, depending on which way you're facing, you know, so you can also feel that on the trees. The trees are warming, the birds are warming. Um, but also there's a rhythm. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, short book that is out of, so out of print. It's like $500 for this book that used to be just some mass market paperback called The Short Timers. Uh, and the be best thing about it was just the way there would be dialogue between guys in this platoon as they're walking. And you know, check that out when you read other things and have notice how people um, talk when they are walking. I, I hate, as many of you have worked with me know, I hate... Um, scenes where people sit across a table and have a conversation. And it's so inert. And I'm always trying to urge you to have people doing something so that there can be a rhythm between the speaking and then you stop speaking to do a little more washing dishes and then you start speaking again. And walking is wonderful because you, the rhythm of exchange is different in walking. Uh, people talk differently. I think people are more intimate because they're not looking at each other. They're walking side by side. I used to walk with my dad. Hey, Susie. I used to walk with my dad um, whenever I was troubled. 
<laughs> which was plenty. And we used to walk together and walk and talk. And some of my fondest memories of my dad were just walking and talking. And there was a rhythm to it. You know, you'd talk a little bit, you'd fall silent, you'd walk along, and then somebody else would say something. Uh, and that's a nice exercise is just to have... Uh, write a scene where people, two people are walking and talking about uh, some, somebody has a problem and they're walking together. It could be a parent and a child. It could be a couple of friends, you know, um, could be anybody. Um, but as far as being, you know, this issue of, of wartime writing to unpack the emotion, you know, rather than just saying, I was scared. It's like, what does it feel to be scared like that? You know, don't, don't let yourself off the hook that fast. You know, there's, there's a lot to be said, you know, watch these interviews with people, you know, looking at their demolished houses or going to work or going to a market and then crouching in the aisle with their kid. And really see if you can put yourself into their bodies and into their experience. Um, I mean, this is the experience of writing is the experience of being able to put yourself into another person's shoes. That's what reading is for. If we couldn't do that, we couldn't, if we didn't, couldn't do that, nobody would read because they'd only want to read about people like themselves, right? And the whole point of writing, of literature, is to get out of the self and get into the larger experience of what it is to be human. And as writers, we do that every day. And when we're just suffused by these, you know, monumental events, um, don't quickly try to write a story about the Ukraine, you know, <laughs> poetry, go ahead, write a, write a poetry, you know, write a poem, write 10 poems, write a, you know, write an essay, but don't try to shove it into your, the story you're writing. This is the time to imagine yourself on the scene in those, in those lives and take notes and put it in your writer's notebook, just call it war. Um, you know, Karen is leaving. She is has a wonderful organization called Right Girl. Uh, Amanda Gorman was a right girl. Uh, you should check that out. And she says, being Ukrainian, I'm surging with emotions and trying to balance the worries and work. But take notes of what that's like. Like, what are you doing when you're divided that way? You know, physically, you know, you're thinking about what's happening in, in Kherson or, or Kharkiv as you're doing what? Grading papers? As you're, you know, washing the kitchen floor? I should keep <laughs> mundane things driving to, you know, a movie. Are you going to go to a movie? Um, you know, think about just capturing those real experiences of being human being in the body. Um, it's, yes, David says being vulnerable can be expressed in so many physical ways, you know, um, and then use your Rosetta Stone. I don't know if you guys remember, that's the notebook where you take a physical, you take an emotion and then you follow it through the body. Like where, if I'm feeling extreme pity, where, where does extreme pity lie in the body? And what you'll find is, is while you, when you start seeing it, it'll start to move. So say I feel extreme pity. Say I, I, it hits me in the chest first. Difficulty breathing, 
You know, I feel a constriction in my throat, constriction in my chest. I might feel, um, you know, it might come out in, in a, a million different ways, but you'll follow it and it'll actually start moving in, through the body and then notice where it's affected and how it's affected. Let's see if I have one of those in my Rosetta Stone. So I use these books for Rosetta Stone just so I can find them, these school books. Um, it's, uh, it's like a somatic dictionary almost. Um, fear is um, weak arms, distended belly, feel fat and saggy, deflated, um, disappointment, um, just all kinds of you know, terror. Where, where in the body do you, do you feel these things? And keep track so that when you have a character who feels them, you know, what, how are you going to describe it? And what I do is I, you can start either way. That's why I call it the Rosetta Stone because Rosetta Stone was found, um, uh, where, it was a stone with laws, you know, um, and it was expressed in like four languages, four alphabets. And because they knew one of them, Greek, they could start um, deciphering the other languages. So I call the Rosetta Stone because I can start with the feeling when I don't even know what I'm feeling. I just feel this emotion. And I can start following it through the body and then realize, oh, yeah, flip to um, a different page and see, oh, yeah, that is um, betrayal. That's how I feel when I feel betrayed. That's what I'm feeling. So you can go both ways. That's why I call it the Rosetta Stone. Um it's something that you really do want to uh, hang on to. This stuff is is invaluable to you. Um, so I'll take a Facebook post. You can do this with anything. Kavanaugh referred to contraception as, quote, abortion-inducing drugs during confirmation. So that was the phenomenon. Physical, my physical reaction to that is um, I felt a pressure high in the diaphragm, nausea, a tight chest, tight in the sinuses, like a fist under the rib cage. And I underlined that because that was a predominant feeling. It didn't move around quite as much as some of the other ones. A feeling of being squeezed by a big hand. Everything's up high, like everything was up, you know, in this region. Um, everything's up high, tight, raw throat, inward pressure, hard to breathe. Emotion is fear and disgust and outrage. So it ends up as being dread. It's like, so that's how you, I, the different ways I feel dread. And I can use any one of them. Uh, when I'm working on a character, um, that my character is squeezed by a big hand. My character's throat is tight and raw. Um, so that's what I mean about the Rosetta Stone. I can start with something, something happen. I can write down my reactions and then I can, I can summarize the emotion or I can start with the emotion and go through the body but this is very worth you know on the very physical level knowing where in the body something's expressed and then you use instead of labeling emotion i was scared i was scared i was scared i was scared i mean you can only say that so many times um you 
can express it in the body. And I, I don't mean churning stomachs, clenching jaws, all that stuff. Um, what I mean is, say, I notice that when I feel um, shock, like shock, dismay, um, I will, say, have trouble breathing. So if I have trouble breathing, how do I use that with a character? You know, um, you know, she took short, sharp breaths, trying, it was like breathing on Mars. Uh, you know, the disappointment, my arms felt, one of the reactions was weakness in the arms, felt, my arms feel very weak. And I, I used that in Paint It Black. I had a character who gets a phone call that is, uh, she finds out that her boyfriend, she gets a call from the morgue, and somebody is likely to have been her boyfriend, uh, is there. And she can, she says, I can could barely hold the phone. Or I think she dropped the phone. Her arms become so weak. Well, I don't say my arms became so weak you know, because I followed the emotion. You don't have to talk about how how you know that. <clears throat> but you have a character make a gesture like could barely hold the phone. That's accurate. And you're, because your reader lives in a body too, they will recognize the emotion. You know, so how do you feel in the Metro in... Ukraine. I mean, listen to the people. They're, t you know, they're being interviewed and take, take those notes. So I want to thank you for joining me for Writing Wednesday and, um, you know, continue to observe and, you know, if you're writing in wartime, you know, just observe and take notes and really put yourself in the shoes of people who are talking rather than just being so focused on troop movements and what's Putin going to do. Um, I also want to say that uh, the Community of Writers uh, Summer Conference is going to happen. I'm going to be teaching and uh the admissions are open until the end of the month. So this is March. And uh, so till the end of March, there is uh, scholarship money available. So if you're interested in working with me and all kinds of other fabulous people, um, try out the community of writers this summer. It'd be great to see you. It'd be really fun to be back. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next week for Writing Wednesday. Thanks. Bye.